to introduce a man, Kent Hance, who's a hero. And I know he's a hero because he hired me. And uh, only a hero. Well, I can think of other people who might have hired me, but he's a smart guy too. So he has to have been a hero, being smart to have brought me to a major university. Because uh, when he did, um, I had a rap sheet in the academy, as long as the Affordable Care Act. Uh, I was wanted by the PC police in virtually every state. And quite honestly, I mean, I had been running the National Association of Scholars for 25 years, uh, making myself a thorn in the side of the American higher education establishment and everyone who is politically correct. I never thought that a major public university would want to have anything to do with me, would invite me to speak, uh, let alone would want me to be part of its team. But I hadn't met Kent Hance, and so I didn't know uh, that there was an exceptional person out there running an exceptional university. Uh, most people who are leading universities today, there are some exceptions, but most people get to where they've gotten to the top by not bucking trends. Uh, they ride the crest of the wave. That's the best way of making a career. Uh, but uh, Kent Hans has always understood that a university is more than anybody in particular within it, more than its faculty, more than its president, more than its chancellor, uh, as he was, that a university is about serious ideas, that a university is about preparing people for freedom, for their role in society as free citizens and that the university is a product of Western civilization. Uh, and if it shuns Western civilization, if it ignores Western civilization, if it continually berates Western civilization, uh, not only will it not very long exist, uh, as a university should, uh, but indeed it will be turning uh, on its own parent. Uh, not many uh, chief academic leaders understand that. It seems rather simple to us, but it's not. It's very hard to understand and to appreciate it and to act on it. You really have to be willing to go up against a lot of things. Uh, when I first came to Texas Tech as a visitor, uh, we had a conversation for about a half hour or so, and he said, Steve, I want you down here. Uh, and uh, I was uh, not only knocked off my feet by that, but um, uh, it was one of the greatest compliments <laughs> I'd ever received. I really never thought that I would hear that from the voice of somebody who is leading a major national university. I could tell you a lot about Ken Tance's career, but I think you probably know uh, most of what I would tell you. Um, the only thing that I will take time to say is that uh, Chancellor Hance is the only person I have ever met who was a character in a major motion picture. Uh, the story of uh, Oliver Stone's story um, of, of uh, George Bush. Um, and when I did mention that to him, he said, and I was better looking than the guy who played me, <laughs> which is right. <laughs> so uh, without further ado, but with an expression of deep gratitude, let me introduce Chancellor Hans. Thank you very much, Steve, and uh, I appreciate your being here. Uh, I will uh, not filibuster. I've uh, been on the other end. It, as, as a public official, someone that served as a state senator to U.S. congressman, you, you go to a lot of banquets. And uh, the record, I think that I, I've never had anybody come close to this, but uh, I went to a high school sports banquet in a little town in West Texas. It started at 7.30, and they introduced me as the... Uh, key speaker at 25 to 12. I've been there four hours and five minutes in a metal folding chair. I was, I was paralyzed from the waist down. Uh, thought I had polio and I'd had the salt vaccine. And uh, I, I got up to speak 
and I spoke for three minutes. And a man came up afterwards and he said, uh, young man, I'll always vote for you. You got good judgment. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I will not, and my friend Talmadge Heflin gave the prayer and did a good job there. And you, you know, the, when, when you were in the house and, and I was Senate, the Senate uh, was uh, a little smarter than the house, uh, uh, we thought, but we weren't in one area. Y'all hired a chaplain and the chaplain was in charge of the prayer and you have a little more control if you're paying the person. We use volunteers and each senator would have a week that he could bring in people from his district to give prayer. And uh, Carlos Truon brought in a, a, a priest from Corpus one time and prayed 17 minutes. And uh, he mentioned three different bills in the prayer and one of them was mine. <laughs> and uh, it, it, it was like House Bill 1285 God uh, we should never pass the house, and we hope you'll <laughs> we, we hope you'll kill it in the uh, in the economic development subcommittee and in, in the Senate. I think, oh, I hope he doesn't mention the sponsor. And uh, but uh, we we suspended Truon's uh, ability to invite anyone to to pray for some time. Um, you know. Uh, Tom Lindsay's, uh, I've worked with him on higher education matters and, and he's a, a good friend and does a good job. And uh, I enjoy working with the Public Policy Foundation. I, I love this new building. Uh, this is something that uh, it really speaks well. It shows that we're permanent, that we're not just passing through. And I appreciate all of you that have helped in so many ways to get us to this point. The, the impact of Western civilization, uh, uh, I uh, had some goals when I went to Texas Tech, and I was there seven years, seven months, and seven days. It was not planned that way, but that's what it came out. And I said, thank God I didn't stay six years, six months, and six days. <laughs> <You know? clears throat> and that uh, when, uh, uh, during that period of time, I donated my salary uh, back to the school, and as my wife pointed out one point in time, how long is this going to go on? <laughs> And I agreed with her, it cannot go on forever. I did it because I loved the university and I wanted to make an impact in some areas. And uh, we're growing the university. We had 26,000 students when we were there and we're up to 35, we'll be at 40 before 2020. I set out to raise money and, and raised a billion, 200 million, uh, which took us from being 127th to being 83rd in the nation. Uh, and we passed Tennessee, Ole Miss, LSU, Arizona, Oregon, a lot of great schools. And so I enjoyed that part. But one other area that I wanted to do something was, was to establish an institute for the study of Western civilization. And I felt like that, that had been, it had been lost in the academic circles. It, it had been pushed to the side and people were afraid to bring it up. And there'd been so much criticism and, you know, we have a pretty good world. There have been a lot of good things come out of Western civilization, more so than any other civilization. And so I, and I wanted the best person for it. And uh, I interviewed uh, Dr. Steve Balsh, and it didn't take me long to say, you're my guy, I want you. I think I was the first guy to ever tell him that they wanted him other than his wife. And uh, I, I was talking in an academic sense. Now, I shouldn't say that. I don't know that she told you that. Uh, but... Uh, uh, I also wanted to set up a, an institute for the study of free enterprise. We did that, and uh, the uh, study is uh, Dr. Ben Powell, uh, who was a uh, protege of uh, Walter Williams, uh, is the guy we hired in that regard. I did that with private money, and uh, we did it to, uh, so that no one could criticize us. If I'd asked for a special line item, the fight would have been on. And so I, I did, and, and I want to mention uh, three people that helped me with that. The late Harold Simmons, uh, he uh, was one of our big contributors. Jim Sal, a Dallas businessman who in 1970, I was a professor at Texas Tech, and he took my course. And uh, he's done exceptionally well. In fact, one day we were talking, and these guys said, is Jim Sal the first billionaire we've had from Texas Tech? And somebody said, I think so if he is, he's close. And, and they looked over me and said, wasn't he in your class? I said, yes, he took notes. And uh, <laughs> they, 
they all chuckled and, and laughed. And one of the guys said, I was in your class. I wish I'd taken notes. I said, we well, should have. <laughs> but the other was late Bob Perry, who was a great patriot and a true American. And I asked uh, his son, Jack Perry, to be here. And Jack, would you stand and be recognized in your dad's name? I first met Bob Perry in uh, 1981, and uh, I was a Democrat. I was a conservative Democrat, and so was Phil Graham. And Reagan, uh, the Republicans had control of the Senate, but not the House. Tip O'Neill was still running the House. And uh, President Reagan asked Phil Graham to carry the budget cuts and asked me to carry the tax cuts. And we got a lot of criticism. You know, I, I think one of the things that the, the uh, Washington Post and New York Times talked about the two traitors, traitors. And that uh, later when Jim Jeffords switched from being a Republican to being a Democrat, they talked about a man of courage, you know. <laughs> so you went from being a man of uh, a, a, a traitor and to being a man of courage. I said, how does that work? And, uh, but I got a call from a friend of mine, and, and uh, Paul Wyrick, and he wanted uh, to introduce me to a gentleman from Texas named Bob Perry who uh, knew that I was catching some flack and they were out trying to get me an opponent and he wanted to help me in case they did get me an opponent. And uh, he came up and we had dinner and, and what a great person and uh, a man that uh, helped me a lot throughout my career and never asked anything except good government. And a man that, that uh, uh, Susanna Martinez, the, the governor of New Mexico, would not be governor uh, had it not been for Bob Perry. He got in and helped her, and he said, he said, Kent, she may lose, but it's not going to be because of lack of money. And she went on TV, and she was fourth in the race, and she wound up winning uh, the primary without a runoff and uh, has, uh, has really done some great things in, uh, in New Mexico in, uh, in the Democrat state. The, uh, today, I've got several things that uh, I want to talk about. And uh, some of them are, uh, are on slides. Uh, this is one of the few times in my life, maybe the only time, that I've, always, that I've used uh, slides. And that, uh, so bear with me in case I uh, uh, have a problem. It, you know, I, Steve was talking about being a professor. I'd, I'd been chancellor about maybe a month. And a professor wanted to see me, and I had an open-door policy. And so he came in, and he said, I'm not getting paid enough. And I said, well, I understand that. And he said, uh, my office is too small. Well, okay, you know. And he said, uh, I, uh, my copy machine and my computer are out of date. My parking space is too far away. And he, he ragged me pretty good. I mean, just everything was bad. And I said, uh, Dr. So-and-so, I wish I had 100 just like you. He said, Why? I said, because right now I've got 2,000 just like you. And, uh, uh, he started laughing, and I, I got him up and, you know, helped him out the door, and I told my assistant, that's provost. Uh, uh, the provost handles those issues in, in the future. But uh, bear with me. Um, the, uh, the thing that... Um, I want to talk about and, and uh, just go over just briefly. We'll see how well I'm going to do. Um, life expectancy. Now, th this is important. Life expectancy at birth. W when you were born in 1850, it had gotten up to 38.3, 38 years. And it, it increased to 48, 10 years over the next 50 years. And part of that was... By 1900, there was such an emphasis on sanitation. Doctors had made improvements. You didn't have people <clears throat> riding in a covered wagon from uh, Omaha to San Francisco. And so the life expectancy at birth had gotten to 48. By 1950, uh, it had gone to 66, and that was a big jump. That was a big jump because of antibiotics penicillin, things like that. That made a huge change. <clears throat> and then by 2011, 
you've had medical changes and, and you've had things that, uh, that have gone beyond penicillin. You, you had, one I had, open heart surgery. You know, that, I work out every day. That's been 19 years ago. And, and when I came to, and Phil Graham told me, if they didn't even take your heart out, if they just sawed your chest and then sewed it back up, it's going to hurt. <laughs> he told me that before I went in. So, uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks, Phil. Oh, <laughs> uh, I appreciate the words of encouragement. <laughs> but I remember this. I prayed to God when I came to. If I can get through this, I'm not going to do it again. And I work out my wife, Susie is here. Uh, Susie, you stand to be recognized. I was... She's a, a lawyer by trade, and, and uh, if you compare her to, to Barack Obama, she really is a constitutional lawyer. <laughs> you know, she's just not making it up. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, what's happened is you look at uh, uh, 38, and you're down here at 7, it doubled. It doubled in 160 years. And innovation and technology is always what? It's going to be better in the future than it has in the past. Always. If that continues at the same level by the year 2175, people will live to be 150. That's hard to imagine. And I find it hard to believe, but it might. You know, don't count out fine minds making great inventions as long as they're not suppressed. And so that, that, that is, is very important to look at. You know, uh, uh, one time I was with my friend Boone Pickens, and the guy was talking, and we were talking about somebody, and, and, and this fellow said, you know, about the age of some friend we had, and the guy said, no one wants to live to be 100. And Boone said, have you talked to somebody that's 99 lately? <laughs> okay, now, a while ago we were saying what was life expectancy at birth. This is the same years, but life expectancy at 30. If you made it to 30, Tamage, I apologize if I get in front of you, just push me. Uh, if, if you made it to 30, uh, you had a better chance, you, you know, you were going to live longer. And so, you know, in 1850, you made it 30, you're going to 64. Uh, and that uh, uh, 50 years later, you're still, you, I mean, you had, it hadn't changed. And then from 1900 to 1950, you know, it jumped six years. And, and part of that was antibiotics and, and other medical inventions. And then... By 2011, it was at 78. And so, you know, that, that we were making strides. But part of that, if you go back and look when Social Security was started, the life expectancy has gone up substantially since that happened. And, and you're looking at uh, over 10 years. If it had been indexed at that point in time, uh, like many programs, then the, the fund would be in good shape now. Uh, I'm not saying that you should do that or should not, but that's something Congress has to look at. You know, uh, at one time when Yugoslavia was a country, they were looking at trying to get people to stop smoking. And they came to the conclusion if they do, they're going to break our Social Security. So they decided not to get them to stop smoking. <laughs> I don't think that was a good decision, but... Uh, uh, it was a decision that was made at, at that point in time. Uh, world per capita income in, uh, in $1900, uh, uh, historian did this study and used uh, uh, constant dollars from 1990. The West was averaging what would be the equivalent of $439, and the world was at 425 A thousand years later, the, the world was at 420 they They'd gone down a little. And uh, the West had gone down more, and the world was ahead of the West. By 1500, the, the West had edged up just a little above them. And then if you look at uh, 1820, 
uh, is almost uh, 1150 versus 675. So it's close to being two to one that the West had done well. And then if you look at 95, uh, look at that, almost four to one. And, and, and the question you should be saying and questions you should be asking, why? And we'll come back to that in just a moment. Uh, world population during that period of time, the West had 25 million uh, in the zero and, and 250 of the world. It goes all the way up. And, and by 95, is 739 million in the West and 5.6 billion. You know, I always think about the, the billion people in China. India, you got a billion. That's a big number. And uh, Tommy Protho was a football coach. He used, this doesn't have anything to do with Western civilization, but it's a great quote that I like. <laughs> and I do that from time to time. I think of a great quote, and Tommy said it's fine. Tommy Protho had a, had a player named Gary Beeman who went on to win the Heisman Trophy. Some of you may be old enough to remember that. Gary Beeman was starting his first game against Southern Cal in the Coliseum and there were 110,000 people there, and it was national TV. And Tommy Protho, the coach, noticed that the player was not blinking before the game. You know, I mean, his first year. And he went over and told him, remember this, Gary, no matter what happens today, there's a billion, 200 million people in China that don't care. And, uh, <laughs> and he was right. Anytime somebody tells me something is, is just is, is so big a deal, I always think back to that quote. And uh, he, he was exactly right. I don't remember who won the game. Another study that uh, Earl Cook did on estimates of, of energy per capita, kilocalories. Neanderthals used two. Prehistoric uh, hunters used five. Ancient farmers, 12, then medieval and early modern farmers, 26. Post-Industrial Revolution, after the Industrial Revolution, you had uh, uh, 77. And that uh, contemporary high-tech society has certainly changed. And uh, that was uh, at uh, uh, 230. And one of the things that uh, has happened, and I want to go through some of these inventions, um, in just a second, and not a lot of them, but uh, in, in uh, slide six, and, and this is one that really gets your attention. This, you read that and you say, why are we apologizing for Western civilization? I'm not. I'm proud of what has happened. 97% of the leading scientific discoveries occurred in Europe or North America, almost all of them in the last 350 years, most in the last 200 years. You know, why? We'll come back to that in just, in just a moment. The, uh, the next slide of the 214 great inventions since 1450, all were in the West. All. Oh. Of these, 65% occurred in Britain or America. And you know, it just, it, it was a, it, it's, it was a big change. And I think that if you look at the inventions, and I want to back up just a, a tad. The science and technology, and, and I made a list. And, and I've, I've used this before. I used it in middle, and I'll tell you about that in just a moment. In the, the things that you're looking at that have happened in communications, the radio, the TV, satellites, the phone, the cell phone. By the way, uh, there's a book that I was reading last year, and in 2011 was the first year more people had access to a cell phone than a toilet. You know, I mean, that's kind of a, I mean, that's unusual. You know, that one, you, you kind of go, well, you know, what does that mean? Um, 
I, I don't know what it means, but it, it, was, it was something that I read that, and I thought, that kind of catches my eye. It's unusual. <laughs> Personal computer. It's changed so much. Memory chip, the internet, camera, copy machine. It was outdated for that profession. The laser printer. Materials, concrete, aluminum, um, PVC pipe, synthetic rubber. Transportation, the bicycle. Bicycle is a great invention. The automobile, the train, the propeller that is used on boats, the big boats. Uh, at our Institute for Western Civilization, you had one of our speakers speak on the big boats. And the Chinese boats? Yeah, well, but, but also the, the big boats of uh, the ships, really, the, the big ship era, and that was Christopher Columbus. And you look at a period over 50 to 60 years, the world was discovered. It had been around for a long period of time, and, and people woke up. Um, the airplane, spaceship, and you know, in sight, glasses, telescope, x-ray, microscopes, medicine, antibiotics, I've mentioned before, very important, uh, ultrasound, stethoscope, man-made insulin to help people with diabetes. And thoughts, now th th this is the important part that I come to, is that the, uh, during that period of time, Western civilization, I I've said all these things that it did, but Magna Carta, the Constitution, those were the big things. They allowed the other things to happen. And that, uh, you know, you can trace democracy back to Greece and, and Rome, but really, when it advanced, and it, it made some great advancements, the right to vote, free speech, those were things that had not, that, that we take for granted that, that were not available in, in societies before. And it changed the world. Also, Western civilization, and so, uh, the left, they don't like to talk about Western civilization. And West, they should. Because if you look at some of the things they're the proudest of, the feminist movement, uh, civil rights movement, things like that, came out of Western civilization. But here's the problem. If you study Western civilization, you're going to find out all the facts on both sides. And there are a lot of people on the left that they're for free speech as long as they agree with it. And if they disagree with it, it becomes some other kind of speech, hate speech or something that should not be allowed. But free speech allows you to discuss ideas. Um, the last slide, and in this one, I think it's, yeah, the last one is the is most important slide. And I, I want to mention that uh, I've got one more slide in, two more maybe, yeah. Okay. The notable inventions, we touched on that. Today, 46% of the world's countries were rated as free. That's about half. 28% partly free. You know, that's, and that's a hard deal. You know, I mean, that's kind of like partly pregnant or something. You know, I mean, you're either free or not free. But there are some that have economic freedom but do not have individual liberties. And then 26% a quarter, not free. Think back as you studied history, the number of people, the number of people that lived in kingdoms. There are not a lot of kingdoms left. What has changed? Why has Western civilization done so well over the last 250 years? The form of government. And it comes back to me to one word, liberty. It's easier to invent things when you're not worried about getting killed if you disagree with someone. It's easier to invent things if you have something to eat. 
it's easier when you have liberty to come forward with great ideas and to think and to talk to other people. You know, Texas Tech, I, I hired uh, Al Gonzalez, and that was very controversial. He had been Attorney General of the United States of America. I want him to tell his experiences. I also hired former Ambassador Bob Kruger, who was a liberal Democrat, and both got good reviews from their students. We're in the idea business in universities. If we ever get out of the idea business, we're in deep trouble. And some people are working as hard as they can to get out of the idea business. But it still comes back to one word, liberty. And this, the next slide is a slide that I show all the students that take my leadership course. And any time I can talk to any students, I always use this one slide. That's the peninsula of Korea. You don't have to say, I don't have to make a long speech. There's two forms of government. One's got electricity, and the other's got very little electricity except in the capital. Look at that. And, and you can look over here, you've got uh, Japan, but you've got South Korea. China doesn't have as much electricity. Look at that. If, and I, I would tell students, when you're deciding how to vote, think about that. Who am I voting for is the closest to this, or who's the closest to this? Now, we don't have anyone running for office that advocates that, but it still tells you the extremes that it can go to. Tyrants don't have a lot of inventions in their society. It, Western civilization, in my opinion, came about because of liberty and people were encouraged to think. They were encouraged to speak. They were encouraged to discuss. And they were in the idea of business. And there were people that made great inventions. Now, I gave a talk similar to this in Midland about a year and a half, two years ago, and I, list, I just went through some of the inventions that I went through with you. And I got through, and a guy came up, and he said, the drill bit. <laughs> I loved it. The drill bit. The drill bit's important. You know, you look at why did we have, why did the Industrial Revolution do so well? We had cheap energy for a couple of hundred years. But all of you, if I ask you, come up with something Everyone in this room could come up with something that's been invented that wasn't on the list that I mentioned. Things that are great. Um, I, I appreciate Steve Ball. She's doing a good job. And that uh, if any of you want to help us with the Institute for Western Civilization, neither Steve nor I will turn you down. And that uh, we have programs every year, and the programs are excellent. Uh, we bring in scholars. Uh, the the lady from Stanford that Caroline Winterer. Yeah, she was excellent, and just had the crowd on the edge of their seats. And, and the the big ships, you know, the, 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 so many things that happen to us. We get very little study of history, and people don't read enough of history, and so they just stumble through, and uh, stumbling through has got us in some places that we should not be. One last thing, and I, I've gone a little over and I apologize. Uh, one last thing that I want to mention. In, in 2008, it became apparent to me that we were not going to win uh, on the Republican side uh, the campaign. And a lot of people say, well, McCain was not conservative. That, that didn't have anything. McCain could have won and would have won. But September the 28th, the stock market changed everything. When the stock market went into a free fall, I don't care who, the camp, uh, who was running the campaign, with the press making such a big deal out of it, it, it was going to happen. And so I thought, you know, one of the big things that Obama said from the word go is that national health care, Obama, Obamacare. And so we started a deal that, that I got started at Texas Tech Medical School. And on Wednesdays, at 6 o'clock, we used a, an old church, 
that was used as a community center. We would have our third and fourth year medical students be there to examine anyone that had a problem. These were people that did not have insurance. And we had someone from each department that was a professor that would be there. And so if you're a student, and we had nursing students, we had pharmacy students there. But if, if, you're, a, if you're a student, you bring the person in and nurses in there, and you interview them, find out what's wrong with them. And then you, you go consult with your professor and bring him in. And he sees if you're right or wrong. It's a great program for the students. But it's a great program for the people that don't have any insurance. A lot of them were working poor. And uh, we had that program. We also, the pharmaceutical companies, which are, are not, is, they're not bad at all. You look at all the inventions and, and it, uh, they, they catch a lot of flag. But if you look at the, at the pharmaceutical students, they would fill prescriptions and we kept things there, anything but narcotics. Now, we got to the point where we were seeing 3,000 people a year. That's a lot of people. Now, I, I, I want, I, and we funded this. The state didn't fund it. The federal government didn't fund it. And I would, I, I want you in your mind to think, what did that cost? 25000 a year. 25000 a year. You can solve the health care problems of this country without spending us into oblivion. Obamacare is more about government control than it is about health care. The American public is the most generous public country in the history of the world. Give over $300 billion in gifts every year. And if you, you say, well, you can only do it because you have medical school. Well, there are other medical schools, but there are other ways you could address those problems. And that if you have the private sector involved, you know, it, it's a way to get things done. But I, I just mentioned that. That doesn't have a lot to do with Western civilization. It does have to do with thinking through problems and trying to come up with solutions. And the last word that I would uh, leave with you as, uh, as I finished here. Western civilization is very important. That's where all the great inventions have come from. Uh, the lifestyle that we have today is because of that. But in my opinion, it goes back to liberty. Thank you.